All right, so the first question, tell me a little bit about yourself. Louisville native, grew up here, went to school here? Yeah, I'm from Louisville, born and raised. Uh, you know, my dad is from Gary, Indiana. He moved down, uh, met my mom, and then, you know, here I am. So, uh, yeah, definitely was born here. Um, went to Butler High School, and, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm from, and that's, that's where I went to school. So, so with this, with this um, podcast and website that you've done, the Humanity Archive, tell people a little bit about it in case they don't know what it is exactly. Yeah, the Humanity Archive is a history education website and a podcast. And um, what I'm really trying to do with it is tell the stories of history in the most compelling way possible. So, you know, I'm, I'm digging into the past and I'm really trying to tell untold stories. Um, whenever I've decided that I wanted to start the website, naturally, I uh, had to ask myself, I want to tell stories, told myself I want to tell stories, but what kind of stories do I want to tell? Um, so I came to the conclusion that I wanted to tell the stories of black people, of, of women, of those people who were underrepresented in history that I saw, I think I saw uh, invisibility and, and, and accessibility to those types of history. So that's the kind of history that I wanted to uplift with the website. So that's my question to you. So when you're at Butler or, or wherever or beyond that, did you know then as a high school student that, hmm, this isn't the complete history or my story isn't really here, or people who look like me, that history isn't here. When did that really become your aha moment? I think when, I mean, as, as a young black man in school, you realize that the people teaching the history, you know, don't really look like you. As we know, you know, most of the teachers in public school are, are white. Um, so I think that I had to be honest, and we have to be honest to say, like, sometimes it, the history that might be important to white people might not be important to a black child. So I think uh, if America is this, this melting pot, right, the pot isn't really being stirred very well because, um, you know, we need more diversity in, in who teaches history so that we can get those different perspectives uh, in history and different stories can be told. So by day you do business, you, you have a, a full-time job. So yeah. is this passion? Is it hobby? How would you couch that? I think it's passion and hobby. I mean, I've always had a, a love for learning. And we go back to my school days in high school, and I like to say that I actually learned more from the Louisville Free Public Library than I think I did in K through 12, because I've always had this love of knowledge and um, this voracious appetite for learning. So in the library, I could just learn whatever I wanted and you know, pick through whatever books I wanted, learn any subject I wanted. And school's a little more prescriptive. It's a little more test-driven. So, um, and I've always had this love for wisdom, for knowledge, and stories. Anthropologists say that the one thing that connects people all over the world, all throughout history, is stories. And history is just stories. So uh, that, that's where my love of history comes from. So story. when did you piece all this together and go, OK, I'm going to take this to a website and a podcast? So how did that come about? Well, I mean, you see now, like, podcasts are exploding. Uh, you know, the age of the internet, where there's low barriers to entry for someone like me who may not have saw history as a career path when I was going to school, but now it's like, wow, I can actually put myself out there. And access. Put a, 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 access, exactly. So uh, that was very accessible, and then I saw a path where I could pursue my passion by putting it out there in that way. The name, where did it come from? Humanity. Well, uh, I think it comes from just this deep belief uh, for me that, you know, the belief in a human brotherhood, a human sisterhood, and um, just trying to connect people uh, through a common humanity where we see the humanity in, in others, and uh, that's what I, what I try to do when I tell those stories, connect that. Let's talk about what we learned and didn't learn in school, and some of the stories that you said, all right, I'm going to tell. So who was the first person you tackled on the website or a podcast where you said, the very first one I want to tell about is who? Well, interestingly, the first person I wanted to tell about was an artist named uh, Katsucha Kahaksa. He painted The Great Wave. and. Um, I think I, I am very much a generalist, too, when it comes to history. I don't just only tell, you know, black history. It's, I tell a lot of different stories. And through him, I just saw someone who, through hard work and, um, you know, someone who had this great passion for art, I kind of saw myself connected in that, someone who has this, also has a great creative passion. And uh, I wanted to tell his story, and it's a very fascinating one. And then for suffrage, because, of course, it's the centennial of a woman's right to vote, then I saw Ida B. Wells, yeah. who was a journalist who was amazing and the risks she Absolutely. took with her job on lynchings. Mm -hmm. What was it about Ida B. Wells? Because she might not be a household name and posthumously was just right 
uh, got repulsor, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, so you think, so we're still evolving, we're still learning because Ida B. Wells, how did we not learn about her? That's a profound question, right? How did we not learn about her? Um, and I think I wanted to tell her story because of her unprecedented courage, because of her uh, unparalleled courage, how she just kind of, honestly, she put her life on the line. She had to go into exile because the story she was telling about lynching, you know, people didn't like that, you know, and they ran her out of town, but she still told those stories. Uh, she had two classics that she wrote back in the 19th century, and um, she just exposed it and used her, her journalistic ability to, uh, you know, push a, a narrative of equality for black people and, and this anti-lynching campaign and also was really deep into the women's uh, suffrage movement as well. You know, there's something that uh, I've read. Well, first of all, you've been getting amazing attention for what you're doing. I mean, I've seen things in the local newspaper, national scene. What has that been like that, that you really are picking up a lot of attention for what you're doing? What does that feel like and why do you think people are paying attention? Well, I mean, for me, I think uh, I always try to have a humility about what I do. So uh, I'm, I'm very glad, though, that it is picking up attention. Um, and I, I think for me, you know, it just propels me to push forward even more because I want to get this, these stories to as wide of an audience as possible. Um, and I think it's picking up attention because I, people, I think people do have an interest in hearing these untold stories. I think people always wanted to hear them and they probably have wondered why they're not being told. So. When they see someone telling them, I think they naturally gravitate to that. You said something, though, in one of the articles that I read that I thought was really interesting. We suffer from historical amnesia. Yeah. Tell me what you mean by that. I think that a lot of times people fail to see that there is a pastness in the present and that, you know, it has effects and consequences. You know, we aren't born in a vacuum, so the things that happened before have an effect now. Um, I think that people also a lot of times fail to see those that came before then who struggled, who fought, who um, stood for something greater and grander than themselves. So by telling these stories, I'm hoping that we can connect to those legacies and traditions and, and try to push them forward. Well, so much of the history has been whitewashed. I mean, the people who are writing the books, the people who are telling the stories, I mean, so much history remains hidden history. So that needs to change, I'm assuming you think as well. And it's so encouraging to see someone who looks like you telling some of these stories. So I'm assuming that's been part of the problem is who's telling the stories. Absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, the problem of the stories that we're getting is because of the lack of diversity. And I think if we can get more diversity as far as, um, you know, different people, different races and things like that, telling the stories, then ultimately that'll, that'll help solve the problem because we're going to have these different perspectives uh, kind of blended together and, and hopefully uh, uplift this this wonderful and, and embrace this diversity that, that's so great for America. You know, and in the lens of today, with everything, with all of the unrest that is going on, do you think it makes such a, I mean, this is, if it's not now, when? I mean, do you feel that with the lens of everything going on in the world? Well, I mean, I, I look at that and in a sense, I do think if not now, when, but I think that ultimately we have to look back and see that um, there's always been people who have been trying to uplift uh, different perspectives in history, right? You had the Carter G. Woodsons who started Black History Month, so since the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, we have to look at those legacies and see, you know, why not? We've been there before, and why, been, why didn't it resonate then? Exactly, exactly. So I just try to place myself in those uh, traditions of those, you know, scholars who have always tried to uplift these stories. and just try to move it forward to the next generation. But do you feel hope that this might be the time? Yeah, I, I do, because I think that uh, unlike some past movements and things that have happened, I see more of a, a multiracial, multicultural coalition happening now where you see different people uh, from different backgrounds, different races, different oh, religions. Oh, White Awakening, I think right. you even referred yeah. to. So you think that that is part of it? I think that is part of it. I think, I mean, I mean, you definitely see people questioning their beliefs, even, uh, you know, you see white people questioning their family. You see uh, white people, uh, you know, very interested in anti-racism and, and just really trying to see how they could stand in solidarity with, you know, the struggles of people who are different than them. So I think, um, for me, that's something different than I've seen with this movement versus, you know, some similar things that have happened before very recently. I will say there's a reckoning with a lot of people that, that's going on. I, I want to know at my age how, how is it I knew so little about so many things? Yeah. And I'm a little embarrassed by that. Mm -hmm. I, I really am. And I think a lot of people 
are now trying to educate themselves in ways perhaps that they haven't done before. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I want to smack myself that I didn't do it sooner, but right. are you seeing a lot of people feeling like that more and more? Yeah, I think that's where I said the awakening is happening, you know, where people are, you know, maybe a lot of this was unconscious, right? Maybe people didn't realize how much they didn't know, and now that they're realizing it, I think that energy is being taken and they're trying to do something about it. So. You know, but the term white privilege that we hear now, a lot of us are, you know, having a reckoning with that, going, you know what? Yeah. There is truth to that. I think there so. There is amazing truth to that. And what we didn't know, but we should have known. Right, right. And I think uh, I've done an ep episode on uh, Socrates that was very profound to me. And one of my favorite quotes is, the unexamined life is not worth living. So you also have to say that the examined life is painful. So by people examining the things they didn't know, you know, those things that, man, that's very, very painful to look at, right? It's not very easy to say, wow. You know, I, I've been thinking kind of wrongly about this, or I haven't been, been going about this the right way. That is painful. So for people to go inside and examine that, I think that's, that's coming out, and we're seeing that more and more. Who else would you like to tell us about who you just were like, I didn't know this person. I can't believe I didn't know. Is there somebody now you're working on that you went, how did I not know this person? Yeah, well, uh, the most recent uh, podcast episode that I did was on the founder of the Mali Empire. His name was Sunjiata Kaita. And um, it's an epic, so it's an oral tradition, an oral storytelling uh, tradition. But, you know, you hear about Homer's Odyssey, and mm -hmm. we watched a movie about Beowulf back in grade school, but we didn't hear about Sunjiata and his epic. is just as fascinating and profound as any other epic that I've ever heard. So I wanted to uplift and tell his story. So how do you find these people? Where is it that you go to find all of these people? We, some we've heard of, but others maybe we haven't. How do you do your research and find these people? Well, if you uh, came into my, my home office, you see books <laughs> everywhere. I got books on the floor. I got books on shelves. So, I mean, uh, again, I, I'm just such a voracious reader and such a, a generalist when it comes to just pulling knowledge and stories. So um, I've got so many written down. I've probably got enough stories to last me a lifetime already. So where are you hoping this takes you with the Humanity Archive? What, what is your hope for it? Well, I mean, ultimately, I, I just want to spark brains. You know, I want to make people think and I want them to, uh, you know, use these stories to become better citizens and, uh, you know, connect to and never lose sight of the humanity of others, whether they come from different backgrounds or, you know, different places or if they think different or look different than them, I want these stories to connect us. So that's my, my grand hope for the Humanity Archive. You have two children. My guess is they're learning different history than you learned. Absolutely. And are you making sure of that? Do you supplement that at home to make sure they know the stories that perhaps you weren't taught that I know I wasn't taught. Right. What I really try to do is just make the knowledge accessible to them, right? So I, I just have various different kinds of books around the house. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that through my work they will see, you know, what I'm doing. And that will pique the interest that they will want to, to go after that history. So, um, you know, I, I don't, pro I, I definitely just try to expose them to as much uh, as I can and, and definitely expose them to, to different histories for sure. But the value in that, if you had learned some of those histories, you know, as, as a young black male in school, to see some of those different role models, because my guess is that was history that wasn't available to you. Mm -hmm. How do you think that would have impacted you at a young age? I mean, if you think about what we talked about, Ida B. Wells was a journalist, right? So. Uh, you know, whether it be for me or just any young black person, if you don't see that example, then you might not see yourself as someone who could become a journalist, right? But then when you do see that example, you see someone who struggled and was able to make it into that profession, and you may see yourself being able to do the same. So I think um, everyone needs examples, right? Examples are what we thrive off of. Uh, most people learn by examples, so to see people who look like you, be able to follow their examples, I think um, definitely is a benefit to any, any child. Absolutely, because I, I, when I saw female journalists, I know that had a profound effect on mm -hmm. me that she's doing it, I can do it. Absolutely. So, so people do look at that. I also saw ignorance is no longer an excuse. Yeah, I mean, people do use that as an excuse, right? And um, I don't think we can do that anymore. Now is the time where we have to use the knowledge that is accessible to us um, to 
uplift something greater, to uh, stand for something greater and grander than ourselves and, and go out and uh, tie a lot of my uh, stories to morality, to justice, to fights and struggles for equality. So, uh, you know, I think we have to, to gain more knowledge in that and uh, ultimately use that to empower others and, and become better citizens. Are you seeing schools change? I know that um, with Du Bois and now we're getting ready for the female females of color school to open as well. It seems like there is this more and more of telling these different histories and hidden histories. Mm -hmm. Same old, same old is not working. Yeah. Right? I do see it. I do see it. Um, there's definitely some different curriculum being put together that I know about as far as people trying to incorporate those different histories consciously because, like you said, it's not just going to happen on its own. So I think there is a conscious effort that probably hasn't manifested itself fully yet because it takes time to put these things together. But um, I definitely see that interest uh, in putting a more diversity in, into the history education in schools. And so people in this audience know, where can they find you? They can find me at thehumanityarchive.com. Uh, you know, my podcast is on all of the podcast players from Apple to Spotify. Um, yeah, so uh, anywhere online, if you just search the Humanity Archive, you'll find me. And a few years from now, where are you hoping this is going to take you? Well, I mean, ultimately, I just see myself as a, a public educator, someone who's able to take this and, uh, you know, just, just take it and use it to, uh, you know, empower others and uh, continue to do this really as, as something long term. So uh, that's my hope. Where do you think this seed was in you? Because you are just... I mean, you just light up the room. Where did that come from, do you think? Well, I mean, uh, it probably came from my parents. Both of my parents are educators. Uh, both of them work for the public school system. So I think seeing them with this passion for education and this passion for communicating knowledge and, uh, you know, educating people, that definitely put a spark in me to do the same. So. And what do they say about all this? They, they love it. They're, they're very proud. So, uh, you know, that's the highest thing I could do is make my parents proud. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Well, thank you for enlightening all of us. All right. Thank you.